Nowadays, I find it easy to get overwhelmed with all the good manga series coming out. Every week it seems like there's a new series and as much as I'd like to check them all out, I just don't have that kind of time. Sometimes I get a series recommended to me that has tons of books out already, which makes me want to turn it down based on the time investment alone. Sometimes I just want a series that I can easily finish in one day, a good low commitment kind of thing. Today I'll be sharing with you three really short completed series that I think are really worth reading. You could easily read any of these in just a few hours ensuring you have tons of time left to do whatever else you gotta do. Before we get started though, I'd like to welcome you to Manga Analysis, where I do little reviews of the manga I've been reading. If you like what you see and would like to see more, make sure to subscribe and leave a like, maybe even uh, leave a comment. Let's, let's get a conversation going. Before we get too deep into it, I figure I should describe what I consider a short series. To me, a short series is one that's been completed in two to five volumes. Now, some series have giant volumes, which may affect whether or not I consider them to be short or not. For example, even though Erased was technically completed in four volumes, those volumes are really big. So I'm choosing to stick with series that are two to five regular size volumes long. Okay, now that that's settled, let's get into it. The first one is All You Need Is Kill. All You Need Is Kill is a two volume miniseries written by Hiroshi Sakurakaza and illustrated by my main boy Takeshi Obata. The story takes place in the not so distant future where Earth has been invaded by an alien species called the Mimic. Humanity has but one way to survive, don on big ol' mecha suits and fire round after round into the beasts. Which, turns out, is really is not that effective. Our main character, Kaiji, joins his first battle only to be killed immediately. But, as he fades into death, he wakes up back at camp the day before the assault. This happens again and again. Turns out, he's in a never-ending loop. Each time he dies, he comes back to the exact same point the day before the assault. How did he get in the loop? Why is he stuck in it? And more importantly, how can he get out of it? I think the series was perfect for the amount of volumes it got. It's a pretty straightforward story with a simple plot, simple setting, and a pretty small cast. If it would have dragged on any longer, it might have spoiled itself. It said everything it had to say, said it super well, and had a great ending. And you know what? That's everything I ask for in a series. What's so great about it is the character development that Kaiji goes through. He goes through the same day over and over again, gaining combat experience each time surviving a little longer than last. This whole experience completely desensitizes him not only to his comrade's death, but also his own. He can't help but become apathetic towards others as he has to repeat this living hell over and over again, just trying to make it out of the loop. The story doesn't try to bite off more than it can chew by trying to give the reader a vast understanding of the human psyche or try to drown us in nihilistic philosophy, but it gives us enough to want to see Kaiji through to the end of his nightmare and perhaps even regain some of that humanity this hellish nightmare has made him lose. Though the only other main character, Rita Vertosky, resides mostly in spoiler territory, I will say that her time in the panels is just as marvelous. Her arc, if you will, takes place before the story starts, so we don't really see her develop as a new character since she's already pretty established, but it was awesome to see how her and Kaiji's parts in their respective stories played out. The mimics are also pretty interesting. They aren't the most well-defined, detailed antagonists I've ever seen, and quite frankly, their design is just okay, but they're really effective monsters for a story like this. At first, they come out as these simple yet unsettling blob-like monsters, but as the story progresses, you find out they're a lot more complex than you thought, and that's all I'm going to say about it. Adding to all that, the art. You've mostly noticed how incredible the art is. The only bad thing about the series being short is we don't really get to see enough of the art. This might just be my favorite of Obata's works after Platinum End, art-wise anyway. Series that come to mind when I think of All You Need Is Kill are 86, Apocims, or Gantz even, sort of. So if you like any of those, even remotely, I'd easily recommend All You Need Is Kill. Also, fun fact about the series, there was a western movie adaptation called The Edge of Tomorrow featuring Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt, and you know what? I didn't even hate it. The next series I'll be recommending today is The Golden Sheep by Kaori Ozaki. The series is for anyone who read and enjoyed A Silent Voice. It's not a copy of it or anything, but it does deal with similar themes and whatnot. Just a heads up, the story does deal with mental health, self-harm, and suicide, so please take that into consideration if you are thinking about picking this series up. 
The Golden Sheep takes place in rural Japan. Sugu, a guitar-loving, rowdy girl, had to move away when she was little, leaving her best friends behind. After several years away, Tsugu is back and ready to rekindle her old relationships with her childhood best friends, Sora, Yushin, and Azari. She's absolutely stoked to be back, but while she might not have changed much since the good old days, her friends have, and maybe not for the best. What's great about the series is how it was able to encapsulate complex adolescent feelings in just three volumes. Again, sort of like the last series, it doesn't try to solve everything, it doesn't try to explain or cure mental illness, but it does put it out there with convincing characters and great simple storytelling. As someone who was a teenager, once upon a time, I found the conflicts the characters find themselves in really realistic. Sure, some are a little simplified or exaggerated, but never feel rushed or cheaped or exoticized. Typically, I am not a fan of the whole super cheery, unrealistically joyful character trope. And Tsugu is is that but i don't mind it there's a point early on in the series where she notices that her old friends aren't who they used to be and their changes scare her yet she is in absolute denial she will smile her way to blissful ignorance and hope that what she's witnessing is all in her head until she just can't anymore and i like that her breaking point happens pretty early on essentially moving the story along as she tries to get that optimism back along with her friends i like that the story didn't revolve around her boundless joy until the very end having it collapse for plot reasons and then having a final climax where she finds it back i find that pretty typical and usually quite annoying the other great thing is the ending. Now, I don't want to spoil anything, but as we talked about earlier, the story doesn't try to solve any huge giant issues that is beyond its scope. Mental health and mental illness aren't things you can just cure, get over in three books. The series essentially works as a roadmap for these characters to get better, and the story ends with the belief and the hope that their journey to recovery will continue post-ending, now that they have the tools to deal with their problems. I mentioned it before, but I don't like when that sort of stuff is rushed. Mental health is a really important issue that necessitates lots of time and care, and having fiction that says it can be dealt effectively after a 9-day quest and shallow character development seems sort of detrimental to the whole thing. For those reasons alone, I feel confident recommending this series. However, I will warn you, it can be difficult to read for the same reasons a silent voice was. Finally, we have Yoshi no Zuokara. The frog in the well does not know the ocean. Or Zuikara for short, because there's no way I'm saying that over and over again. Zuikara is probably the funnest, most interesting series on this list, in my opinion. It's a three-volume series by Satsuki Yoshino, the lad that gave us Hanukkah and Barakamon, which just so happened to be stories I really enjoyed. Okay, so the story follows semi-successful, sort of failing mangaka Tono. Tono, at one point, had a pretty okay series being run in a magazine, but since then his stuff keeps getting cancelled, which ultimately leaves him feeling mighty depressed and super unconfident. His editor eventually suggests he steps away from the isekai fantasy and maybe try coming up with a story closer to home, something more personal. The problem is, Tono lives on a tiny island and has never really set foot outside of it. How could he even consider telling stories from his life when his life is just so boring? Would people really be interested? interested in the slice of life tales of four country bumpkin boys as they get into all sorts of mischief on their tiny island? Surely not. Tono doesn't think so anyway. Nuh uh. Little does he know though, he's about to get the surprise of his life. Right off the bat, this is one of the funnest series I've ever read. Not funniest, mind you, funnest. There's something really fun about a super introverted, self-loathing manga artist needing to go fishing in order to get material for a fishing chapter in his manga, only to realize he knows nothing about fishing and end up relying on the town folk to help him figure his stuff out. While all this is happening, he's constantly doubtful that any of this is going to make his story successful, because why would anyone care about some kids fishing after school on some distant remote island? And that's the thing that's amazing about this series. Some of the chapters in this manga are chapters from Tony Tono's manga, which are these super slice of life, pleasant, low-key anecdotes. Tono's story itself, Zuikara, is a slice of life, pleasant, low-key story featuring all sorts of little anecdotes from Tono's life as a manga artist. Seeing him freaking out about how he thinks his manga isn't interesting makes the manga I'm reading pretty interesting. There's this super wholesome charm to this story that always made me want to come back for more. As the story progresses, you see Tono slowly come out of his shell and open up to the rest of the community as they help him grasp the reality of the island that he spent so long hiding from. The series is honestly one I can recommend to most manga readers out there, but specifically for fans of Barakamon, Girls Last Tour, Komi Can't Communicate, and Bakuman. 
Well, there you go, three short completed series. Whether you're into high octane action, mecha stuff, slice of life, coming of age, comedy, melancholy, or just simply a good read, I reckon at least one of these should pique your interest. All three of these series can easily be read within a few hours, perfect for a proper binge fest or as a quick read before bed. I hope you enjoyed this little video, and if you did indeed enjoy it, consider subscribing. This was Manga Analysis, and I'll see you in the next one.